Let's be honest. It's a little boring when a discovery is made and a scientist can tell us everything there is to know about it immediately. Where's the sense of mystery in that? It's far more fun when scientists and historians are left just as confused as we are. We know of several discoveries that have left the world's sharpest minds just as stunned as the rest of us, and we've put together a fine collection of them for you in this video. The Gate of the Sun in Tiwanaku, Bolivia is a 10-ton mystery. Known as Puerta del Sol in its home country, this entire structure was carved out of a single andesite block. While some sources claim it was created by the Tiwanaku culture around 3,000 years ago, there are scholars who believe it's closer to 17,000 years old. The structure is 10 feet tall and 13 feet wide, and was once part of an even larger building that stood at the top of the Pyramid of Acapana. The inscriptions on its surface are truly enigmatic. One of the few that can be recognized is Viracocha, the great creator of Inca mythology. Surrounded by winged creatures similar in shape to those that can be seen on ancient monuments in Mesopotamia. It appears to have been abandoned in an unfinished state, and is cracked in two by what might have been a lightning strike. The advanced stone cutting techniques that would have been required to create this structure ought to have been impossible 3,000 years ago, let alone 17,000. So we are forced to class it as a monument of unknown origin. How could a 15th century Italian soldier do battle at night if it was too dark to see his opponent? Did he go to bed and wait until morning? No, he used a lantern shield. The curious shields featured a small hole at the top into which a lantern could be fitted, accompanied by a second compartment for oil. That way a soldier could keep fighting all the way through the night until the sun came up. An alternative theory is that the lantern was supposed to be an offensive weapon designed to blind an opponent. Historians differ in opinion about whether the devices were genuinely used in combat or whether they were only used by the ancient equivalent of police officers patrolling the streets of Italian cities at night. In any event, they were probably more trouble than they were worth. It would have been easy for the oil to leak out across the shield, setting the arm of the wearer on fire and leaving him at a significant disadvantage. It might not be a perfect invention, but it's extremely forward-thinking for its era. Did the ancient Egyptians have electric light bulbs? Probably not, but the existence of the Dendara relief leads some people to believe it might have been possible. The famous carving is below the Temple of Hathor in the Egyptian city of Egypt, and is better known as the Dendera light bulb. It's not difficult to understand why. To our modern eyes, the objects shown being lifted overhead by human figures in the carving look a lot like light bulbs, complete with filaments and wires to connect them to a power supply. Experts in Egyptian mythology prefer to think of them as representations of serpents being carried aloft on lotus leaves. That's more plausible, but we don't see this design repeated anywhere else in Egypt. We've long suspected that the ancient Egyptians had access to higher forms of technology than any other civilization of their era. We don't even know how they built the pyramids. Is it really too hard to believe that they could make large primitive light bulbs? Perhaps so, but this carving raises questions that scientists struggle to answer. Where did the art of map making begin? Well, based on the existence of the saint Belek slab, the answer might be France, 4,100 years ago. The slab was first found in 1900, but wasn't studied properly and was then misfiled at a museum for more than a century before it was found again and studied more rigorously. That more recent 21st century study has identified the presence of carvings on the surface that bear an uncanny resemblance to the topography of the region around the River Odette. The similarities are thought to be too striking to have happened by chance, and so there is a growing agreement in the scientific community that this Bronze Age artifact may genuinely be the world's oldest map. 
If it really is a map, it's probably a visual record of all the territory controlled by an ancient tribal leader or king. To compound that theory, the map appears to have been deliberately broken, burned, and buried at some point in the distant past. That might have been a symbolic act to represent the seizure of the area by another unknown ancient leader. Logic, science, and history all tell us that human beings weren't capable of powered flight until the early years of the 20th century. Mythology tells us otherwise. According to a whole host of different and independently written Sanskrit and Hindi texts, the oldest of which dates back over 3,500 years, the ancient residents of India took to the skies as the pilots of flying vessels called Vimanas. A text known as the Veda provides a compellingly detailed description of a Vimana, telling us that they had a wheel, a control panel, 12 pillars, and more than 300 pivot points with full articulation. Apparently, they generated a trail of flames as they lifted off from the ground. Both the Mahabharata and Ramayana texts specify that ownership of a Vimana was a privilege restricted to the ruling class. We don't have any physical evidence for the existence of Vimanas, and it's easy to write them off as a fabrication. But it's puzzling that so many ancient writers claim to be first-hand eyewitnesses of their capabilities. On the other hand, why would technology that allowed humans to fly suddenly be forgotten for thousands of years? A few moments ago, we mentioned the fact that we don't know how the Great Pyramid of Giza was built. It turns out that we don't really know what's inside it either. In 2017, a team of scientists identified and pinpointed an enormous hidden chamber inside the pyramid. The 100-foot-long void is large enough to stash an entire Boeing 747. This is the first significant new discovery about the pyramid's interior since the 19th century. The chamber is directly above the grand gallery and positioned at the same angle. The void can clearly be seen on scans of the pyramid made using cutting-edge technology that tracks the movement of subatomic muon particles, but it doesn't appear to be connected to any tunnels or other points of entry. It's possible that there's something inside the void that was deliberately walled up when the structure was built some 4,500 years ago, but it's impossible to find out without breaking into it. Because of the severity of the damage that would be done to the pyramid by cutting it open, the Egyptian government has thus far refused to allow it to happen. The existence of Greek fire is an established historical fact. We know that it was used against the enemies of the Byzantine Empire at Constantinople in 673. Records from the time said that the fire was so powerful that it even spread across the surface of the water, spreading from ship to ship and wreaking havoc and terror. It was basically the ancient ancestor of the modern-day flamethrower. The secret of how to make Greek fire was guarded jealously by the Byzantines, with good reason. It was the staple of their military success, and it gave them a huge advantage against any opponent. When their empire eventually fell, they took the secret with them. All of their contemporaries attempted to create their own version of Greek fire, and all of them failed. Even now, scientists aren't 100% sure what it was made of. It's likely that it would have been impossible without some combination of quicklime, sulfur, and phosphide. But other ingredients would also have been necessary, and we might never know what they were. Perhaps it's best that we never find out. The last thing the world needs is another weapon of mass destruction. Ask a scientist, and they'll tell you that the Incan ruins of Olentetambo are relics of a 15th century city built by the order of Emperor Pacachuti. To believe that, though, is to selectively ignore a few inconvenient facts. The emperor may very well have ordered a city to be built here during the 15th century, but it's highly likely that much of the stonework of Olentetambo was already there. In fact, the foundations might have been laid 12,000 years ago. 
The whole site almost feels like a trick designed to defy science. The 50-ton blocks of stone that are present here must have been dragged up the side of the mountain. But how? Why are the surfaces of so many of the stones so smooth that they almost feel like glass? How is it that the stones fit together so perfectly that it's impossible to pass a piece of paper between them? Even these humble-looking crisscross marks on the Temple of Condor are inexplicable. They look like they were made using saws, but the people who built this site didn't have saws. We don't have good answers to any of these questions, and nor do scientists. When you think of the battlefields of the 16th century, you probably don't imagine rocket launchers playing much of a part. Rocket launchers require rocket technology, and that's a comparatively recent invention. That didn't stop the Koreans from using something very similar, though. This is a huacha, and it would have struck fear into the hearts of enemy soldiers. The name translates into English as fire chariot, which gives you a clue as to its function. The fact that the Japanese failed to conquer Korea during the Imjin War can largely be put down to the Hiwaka. In basic terms, it's a two-wheeled cart that carries a board full of holes. Into each hole could be inserted a large arrow, propelled by a tube of gunpowder connected to its shaft. It might not have used any rocket technology, but it was a rocket in every other sense of the word. Early Hiwachas could fire up to 100 gunpowder-propelled arrows at a time, but later, larger models doubled this capacity. While the Imjin War was the weapon's finest hour, some anecdotal evidence suggests they might have been around as early as the 14th century. For centuries, we thought that the way Bronze Age people in the United Kingdom made thread was a process that involved spinning. As of 2018, we now know that these Bronze Age people didn't spin their thread at all. They used surprisingly sophisticated plant fiber technology to splice it. That sounds complicated now, so imagine how complicated it must have been 3,800 years ago. The process involved taking individual strips of nettle, flax, lime tree, and any other applicable material and then joining them together without first softening them with moisture. The same technique has been detected in pre-dynastic Egyptian textiles, but was always thought to have been limited to that part of the world. With this discovery, and a similar Neolithic era discovery recently being made in Switzerland, it appears the process might have been almost ubiquitous across the entire ancient world. Spinning is far more efficient as a process, but it now seems that splicing was discovered first, and remained in use for far longer than most people imagined. Stripping each material from the plant stalk and joining them one at a time is a process so time-consuming that creating a length of thread might have taken weeks. In late 2016, Professor Sherry Towers of Arizona State University conducted a detailed study of the architecture of the Sun Temple archaeological site in Mesa Verde National Park, Colorado. What she found there astounded her. The site contains equilateral triangles, Pythagorean 3-4-5 triangles, and a golden rectangle. While it's possible to imagine that one of these shapes might have been made by accident, the chance of all three of them being present accidentally are so slim they might as well be non-existent. This is despite the fact that the site was created 800 years ago by people who didn't have a written language and aren't thought to have had a numerical system. How is that possible? Perhaps we'd know more if we understood the purpose of the Sun Temple, but we don't. Aside from knowing it was an important focus of ceremonial activity, we have no idea what it was used for. Similar principles appear to have been used in the construction of Pueblo Bonito, so this isn't an isolated example of the genius of the Pueblo people. They must surely have known of a way of doing this that eludes our imagination. Here in the 2020s, 
Many of us have Bluetooth speakers in our homes that answer our questions and control many of our household appliances. It's easy for us to imagine that these devices will one day progress into fully functional robotic assistants, perhaps capable of doing the housework for us. Philo of Byzantium would laugh at that idea, because he had a helpful household automaton 2,300 years ago. Hero of Alexandria once wrote of a similar device, but Philo's invention comfortably predates Hero's. The automatons were simple, but served a very important function at parties. When released from a break, the statue-like figures would roll toward guests. The guest then placed a cup into the left hand of the automaton, which depressed an internal latch inside the automatic servant's body and moved the right hand, which poured wine into the guest's cup. Once a certain amount of wine had been poured, a change in air pressure prompted the hand to return to its original position. Philo probably saw it as little more than an impressive party trick. But here we are more than 2,000 years later without robotic wine servants of our own. Subscribe to the channel, turn on the notification bell, and enjoy watching new videos on my channel. Thanks for watching and see you soon.